The Late Morning Program with Nam Ras Podcast. Has lost its uh, monitor. Oh, yeah. yeah, the little pop up thing's gone. Oh, oh there you go. I'm recording. I'm just rolling. Okay, we're live. Going straight live to the internet. Okay, the late pod. The, the late, late morning pod. pod. The late morning pod. The late morning pod. Your account is private, but it's not. Anyway, whatever. We can do it after. Yeah. It's all good. This is the way. So welcome everyone to the late morning program, season three, I think it is, and uh, we're here with an old friend, Sita Bhatti Prabhu from New Zealand, all the way in sunny New Jersey. <laughs> what brings you here? Ironic. Um, well, I heard that you're only doing the podcast in person, so <laughs> what else is there to do but to fly over, right? Nice, nice. Well, you know, you made a lot of waves with that first one we did. We're not going to say the word because I don't want to get banned by YouTube. Sure. But either you um, know or you don't know by yes. this point, right? If you don't know what we're talking about, go to my YouTube page, and Late look Morning for most Program. Popular. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, second or, th second or third. Kadamba Khan and Swami's was very popular. Right. But it's um, in the top three. It's in the top three. Yeah. So um, that made a lot of waves. What, uh, what were like the outcomes or kind of repercussions from that? Good or bad? Um, it, it kind of turned me into a lightning rod, you know, mm. uh, for people. Um, it was, it, it's become a large part of my profile within ESCON, you could say. Mm. You know, I can travel pretty much anywhere in the world and people are like, hey, you're the guy from the Nam Ross podcast. You know, they recognize me from that. Yeah. And um, a lot of people appreciate it. Some people don't. But a lot of the people who interact with me around that, you know, I just roll into the temple in, in, you know, in Europe and they recognize me off the street, ask me to give the class. So a mixed reaction, really, you know. Um, right. You know, joy and happiness, mostly relief mm -hmm. sort of um, from, from devotees. I think at that time, a lot of people f did not feel that they were being adequately represented. Yes. By people who are speaking publicly. And then to hear me speaking in a way that when I'll oh, finally someone's saying like what my perspective or viewpoint, this is what I was hoping for. And so that really resonated with people. So it was kind of like the right chord, the right time. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I remember so much, so much, so many good messages I got. A few people who didn't really, who didn't appreciate it and didn't like it, but a lot more uh, people appreciating it and being like, thank you for doing this. Some Mataji during Rath Yatra coming, like touching my feet because of really, that. Yeah. Okay. And I was just like, Oh, what are you doing? It's just like, no, you know, like, cause they felt just heard and understood. And they're they, like, you said, they're represented. Yeah. I think it's really important. Yeah. I, I can totally get it. Um, I mean, we went out and did Harinam in protest marches in New Zealand leading up to the big, um, parliament occupation that went on for three weeks and is the subject of a, a two and a half hour documentary movie that's just come out. It's going to number one in the box office in New Zealand right now. It's going to be out internationally. Yeah. But in the lead up to that, we would go out and do Harinam. And for some reason in that period, it suddenly became controversial to chant Hare Krishna. You know, like after having chanted Hare Krishna and all manner of, you know, things, tear gas, protests, economic, you know, collapse in South America chanted through all kinds of things. We just went out and started chanting in large marches in New Zealand and, and it had become controversial. Nobody minded if I went to the, did a 
you know, chanting in the pride parade or anything else. But suddenly this became controversial and um, it really took something for myself and for other devotees to keep drawing ourselves forward in the face of that opposition. Like you're normally used to opposition maybe from the council or from some people who are envious or whatever, but not so much from like within the movement and the leadership saying, you know, suddenly, you know, we don't chant Hare Krishna at particular things. It was never a thing before. But while we're out on those Hari Nams, things would happen like we would be out there, the two of us doing Hari Nam, this big whole field full of people, and then suddenly um, there were people there blowing conches and then showering us with flower petals. Someone else was there, like they just, you know, just converged around us two people blowing conches and then a lady there throwing flower petals over us. And I was with this other devotee, Sevaka Vatsala, and we were just like, dude, if you wanted a sign from, you know, from God, like the demigods literally incarnating and like blowing the conches, throwing the flower petals. So kind of like even a lot of devotees themselves saw the podcast and felt like, okay, you know, it's a sign. Mm. And then I was also getting signs as well. And I can understand where that Mataji was coming from, that she would see you at the Rathi Yatra and be like, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Two things about that. One thing is that devotees, especially leadership, they want to integrate themselves into society, sometimes in such a uh, big way that they don't want anyone to think like that devotees might be uh an opposition to the this this thing that they're trying to integrate themselves into and then secondly i think that what was my second point i can't remember but that point mm. what would you say to that because there is some merit in that isn't it that we want to be a part of society because in society we'll say this is something good and we want to support it and that's krishna consciousness um, so fundamentally what you're saying is we should do something because like in an order to, you know, yes. because of the consequences or the outcomes, Yes, which is, um, let me talk specifically because yeah. I don't want it to be too abstract. Yeah. We should be on board with whatever the government mandates because we want society to see that these people are law-abiding citizens we support them therefore we support krishna consciousness and the spreading of krishna consciousness i'm uh, kind of playing the devil's advocate in some way yeah i understand um first of all i want to demonstrate that i understand what you're saying yeah so what you're saying is that we have a particular mission to accomplish in the world it's the spreading of krishna consciousness yes and as, as part of, or as, a, as, a, as an integral part of um, accomplishing that, we want to secure the cooperation, um, the appreciation, and at the very least, not provoke unnecessary direct opposition. Exactly, exactly. In, in the general populace. Yeah, yeah. And so the argument is that in order to achieve that, we should go along with whatever happens to be generally popular at the time. Like if everybody is congratulating India for landing on the moon, we don't come <laughs> out and talk say, about that. you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we don't say Prabhupada denied the moon landings before they didn't happen. We congratulate them, right? Yeah. And, and go along with whatever it is in, in order to not antagonize them and to have them on side with us. And if there's a fringe minority, you know, if the media reports that there's a fringe minority that supports something, we shouldn't allow or, or even endanger ourselves of being associated with that because it will create a negative impression of us and that will impede our mission to spread Krishna consciousness. That's what you're saying. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a complete deviation. Really? <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. That's not our mission. Um, we are not law abiding. That's the first mistake to make. Dharmam tu sakshat bhagavat pranitam. That real religion is the laws that are laid down by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. If you say that we're law abiding, what happens if they make a law that says you're not allowed to chant Hare Krishna? Are we law abiding mm. or do we chant Hare Krishna? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That, that we can't say that we're law abiding because we're not. It might be that, 
you know, sometimes what we do and the laws coincide, but if they make, if the gut in a surat government makes laws that contravene Dharma, then we don't abide by that. Yeah. When they say you must discriminate between the Vaishnavas on the basis of some bodily designation and reject some of them and accept others, we just simply don't accept that because we're not law abiding. We follow, we follow the Shastra, we follow the, the saints and you know, the law is like way down underneath all of that. But in reality we have been, because it just hasn't happened a law where you can't chant Hare Krishna. So in some ways, because it, because it hasn't happened yet. No, I mean, look at Australia. There are letters from Srila Prabhupada um, in the in the Chaitanya Charitamrita itself in the purports. He, he calls it out specifically that, you know, devotees were being arrested and jailed right. for chanting. Yes, yes. And Srila Prabhupada said, go on chanting. And then he said that the devotees said, should we get a lawyer? And he said, don't worry about wasting money on a lawyer. They, you, they put you in jail. You just go on chanting Hare Krishna. Mm. We're not law abiding at all. We changed the laws. We changed the council regulations in these countries by going out and doing it. The airports, you know, we, we took it to court and That's fought right. it in there. That's right. Yeah. You know, the idea that we're a law abiding, uh, organization is frankly ridiculous. And of course people also argue against it and say, you know, it's practically a criminal organization in so many instances and respects. Why suddenly now you're going to say that, oh no, we're law abiding. And then particularly when it comes to chanting the holy name. Yeah. Like we've broken so many laws. Everybody who's been around ISKCON knows the lax kind of, you know, like, like, let's go and steal the neighbor's flowers from there to, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, visa right. fraud about bringing people over and telling the government you're paying them a salary when you're not. And they're doing service in the temple, right? Yeah. yeah. That's a widespread thing in ISKCON. Yes. Uh, everyone knows that. You know, if you're around, you're, you know, so to claim a moral high ground that we're a law abiding organization and that's why we're not chanting Hare Krishna at this event. It's madness. Absolute madness. Yeah. There's no moral high ground there at all. The other thing I remember what I was going to say was, is there, was there instances, I, I know what the answer is, but for the, for the sake of our audience, for the record was, yeah. was there instances where leadership was saying there, there is you should not chant Hare Krishna here because it's not the right time and place or something. Yeah. And, and like even, and what is your view on that? Because in some ways you can say, yeah, if you're going along with what I, the initial thought that I made that we want to be law abiding, et cetera. But in the universal perspective of Hari Nam and chanting Hare Krishna, is there, does that hold any weight or water? What's that? That that there's um, there is no such thing as a good time. It's always a good time. Well, it has to be right because otherwise you're considering the chanting of Hari Krishna to be one of the auspicious ritualistic activities offered in the Vedas as fruit of activities karma kanda, <laughs> right. which are subject to particular time, place, and circumstance considerations. Yeah. Whereas the chanting of of the holy name is always auspicious. It is an asmarane nakalaha. It has no hard and fast rules for its chanting. Yeah. You even have the incidents of like the frame story of the Bhagavatam itself. Parikshit Maharaj is asking the question, what is the duty of all human beings at all times and, and specifically of one who's about to die? And of course the answer is that it's always to remember, glorify um, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Hari, his name, form, pastimes. And then you have the pastime of Gopal Guru, the young boy Gopal. Yes. It's, it's apocryphal. I've tried to find the source. It's not in the Chaitanya Bhagavat, Chaitanya Charitamrita. That's true. Yes, I don't know where it is. About it. Yeah. Yeah. Can't find it. But, you know, it was widely accepted right up until 2020 or 21 that, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or some other devotee was going to the bathroom, came out holding his tongue. And someone's like, why are you holding your tongue? He said, well, I can't stop chanting Hare Krishna. Yeah. But I was going to the bathroom and it's an unclean you know, play. So I had to stop my tongue from chanting. And Gopal, who was a young boy said, no, the, um, the holy name is always auspicious. You should always chant it. You might die while you're in the bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, and then in the Bhagavatam, you find that like the sun, uh, sterilizes a filthy place and doesn't become contaminated itself in the same way. The holy name never becomes contaminated. It's, it's the ultimate purifying all auspicious, you know, and, and this is the, the age of Kali Yuga. 
And it's the particular Kali Yuga where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes. Swayam Bhagavan, Radha and Krishna combined. Yeah. And and Premadan Harinam Sankirtan. Golokya Premadan, you know, it's the prescribed religious process for the age, the chanting of the holy name. So to say that there's like, you know, insert and 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 like really get this that the claim that's being made here is that there are certain political things that are acceptable and political things that are not acceptable for chanting the holy name. You're putting political considerations on the chanting of the holy name. And you're doing it in the name of public relations and consequences, but nobody can calculate the consequences. Nor are we commanded to do that. We're not commanded to chant the holy name when it's a good idea. We chant, we're, we're commanded to Grihe tako, vane tako, sadahari bole dako. Yeah. Always chant. Always chant. How else do you represent the Hare Krishnas other than chanting Hare Krishna all the time? Not that we're pro this or we're anti that, but we are chanting Hare Krishna no matter what. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to that time when I did that podcast with those devotees who were distributing books at a Trump rally. Okay. Devotees had issues with that because they were putting on Trump uh, you know, make America great again hats and going and being like, oh, we support you. We're uh, not, they didn't say we support you, but we are distributing these books at a Trump rally and we want to blend in and be like them, which I thought was smart, but some devotees had issues with that because it's, you're representing that some, that's something that people think is not right or evil or on I, the wrong side. I personally wouldn't, wear that hat mm -hmm. while I was doing that. Cause I just go, you know, st I just play it straight, play my character straight. You know, that's what I like about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, to, to, to just explore that idea, you know, the devotees who were against that, you know, are any of those devotees pro Krishna West? Not sure. Because that would be an interesting intersection, you know, if you were like pro Krishna West, but anti wearing a MAGA hat at a Trump rally. It's like, you know, because the, the Krishna West idea is that you dress like other people do so that they can relate to you, you know? Yes. Oh, right. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what they're doing. So it's the Krishna West principle applied to the Trump rally. Right. So it would be inconsistent to be pro Krishna West and anti MAGA hat at the Trump rally. Mm. I don't know if anybody took that position, but I, I, I just... So. In the protests, I just wore a pink dhoti, you know, for like character um, identification. So, you know, yeah, people just always remember the guy in the pink dhoti, you know. <laughs> and then on Lord Nityananda's appearance day, February 14th, which was Valentine's Day, was the day after the cyclones in the parliament occupation there. Um, this kind of like rainbow top arrived. And that's the famous shot of me playing Rodunga wearing a, a rainbow top and a pink dhoti. And I just kept wearing that day after day. So people could identify me, you know, the Hare yeah. Krishna guy. Yeah. Do you ever feel that it's become so divided in the world, even within our society, that what can we do to help that? Or should we just continue with our strength in our in our, you know, own convictions of something and not care about, oh, you'll show your love to me by how you cooperate with each other. I mean, it can, goes both sides, right? The Each side cooperating with each other. But this I guess what I'm asking is the divisiveness. Did that ever like, you ever think about how we can not be as divisive as we have been as a so society, even as a, you know, society, uh, you know, greater than the society as a, as a humans in right now in 2023. Um, it's not really a high, in terms of my psychological makeup of my character. Yeah, yeah. Um, harmony is not high on the list. Interesting. No way. Innovation is high. Doing the right thing is high. Right. Like, you know, oh, can we, can't we all get along? I'm like, can't, can't you do the right thing? <laughs> That's more important than getting along. Like going along to get along, doing the wrong thing so that we get along. And then pragmatically, if you have a look at like, many of the leaders who are influential in ISKCON today have previously splintered off completely from the organization. Mm. You know, they were at New Vrindavan, for example. Mm. You know, you have the Bhakti Center 
here in New York that was the sanctuary, right? Yeah. Then it came back in. And, you know, those leaders who came back in didn't just come back in at the bottom. They came back in at the top. That's, if you have a look at the history of the organization, it's actually how it works. You want to do anything, you know, if you just want to be a cog in the machine, sure, you do that. But, and this is not, I'm not saying that this is my motivation. I have no aspirations for like climbing the corporate ladder inside the Vatican called ISCON, right? <coughs> the important thing to me is the execution of the <coughs> mission, which is Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtanam, total world victory of Hare Krishna. Yeah. That the whole, the three worlds are inundated with the chanting of the holy name and that we establish Daivi Van Ashram Dharma on this planet. That's what we're doing. Mm. And people are just going to have to deal with that. Because if you think about it, if that's what we're doing, people are going to have to deal with that. But if we're just like, we don't want people to have to deal with us. We want to look like them. We want them to think that we're exactly like them. We want them to think that they don't want, that they don't have to change anything to become a Hare Krishna. They're going to go and join Islam. Because they're like, it's the people who are like, you know what? I'm not okay with the way that things are and the way that things are going. They're creatively dissatisfied and they're looking for an alternative. And then you roll up and you look exactly like, you know? Yeah. And the most committed, most courageous, most active people who are going to actually do something, they're no longer your target market. That's really interesting. There are devotees who are, you know, they say, come as you are to Krishna consciousness and we shouldn't wear dhoti. They're kind of the Krishna West archetype of that. I mean, here we are dressed in our Krishna West uniform I right mean, now, right? Yeah, I mean, like, this is how I normally dress. Yeah. But I do appreciate wearing devotional dress, even outside. Because then people are wondering and they ask you about it. Hey, like, what, yeah. do you, what is this about or something? Exactly. And then you tell them that these are the clothes that we wear in Goloka Vrindavan. <laughs> and you can't go back home back to Godhead unless you develop your Sutta <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Right. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a cough. That's that. I, I'm I'm presenting a straw man there. Of course, yeah. it's street theater. It's 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 like Srila Prabhupada would say. You know, you recognize the um, policeman by his uniform. So similarly, people. It's the Hari Krishna guy. You know, yeah. it's one of those religious extremists who are a cross between the Taliban and the Amish, and who you know are dedicated to taking over the world for their shadowy, invisible master, Lord Vishnu, right? That's mm. what they think when they see us. Yeah, yeah. Or they think it's the Hare Krishnas, you know, something like that. Mm. I did want to talk about the... Um, did you have anything else about the um, about the previous episode or anything? Like that, you know, the shot one that we did. Yeah, um, just that it's had a huge impact. And prior to that, I considered that my my greatest contribution to the mission up to that point had been a paper that I wrote in 2008, I want to say, mm -hmm. which was um, Resolu GBC Resolution 311, a risky, sets of risky precedent. It was about annotations. And it was okay. defending Srila Prabhupada's book, books from this GBC resolution for the BBT to annotate them. And I just made the argument, well, who's going to annotate them? Is it going to be Bhakti Vikash Swami or Amara Das, the head of the gay and Galva. lesbian yeah, right. Vaishnava association. Like, right. You're never going to find anyone that people can agree on, so don't do it. Right. We, uh, one thing we know for certain is that everyone who's here right now agrees with Srila Prabhupada, right? Yeah. Otherwise, they're, you know, they're kind of outside the conversation, you know? They're, they're in a different category. Tell us of, of, of what, it, what that looked like, the annotation. Like, what was that whole thing about? Um, it was about, like, whereas... Srila Prabhupada's books have been misquoted and misunderstood and used to um, like discriminate or oppress women and particularly with reference to the quote about, you know, oh, quote. Yes. Therefore, the GBC resolves that the BBT, you know, an annotate the books or look at annotating the books or something like that. That was in 2008? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it just, it just appeared suddenly in the resolutions. I was just reading them. <coughs> And I read it and I was just like, what is this? Yeah. This fundamentally, this is a fundamental transformation of the relationship of like the members of ISKCON, the GBC, Srila Prabhupada's books. Now they want to interpose another voice in Srila Prabhupada's books. What happens if the person who wrote the annotations later falls down? Yeah. Or it's revealed that they're deeply deviating when they wrote them. 
Like, I mean, if it's in another book, at least you take that book off that shelf and put it on the other shelf over there, you know, the Fallen Acharyas <laughs> library. <laughs> but what do you do if it's been baked into Srila Prabhupada's book? Yeah. And then even apart from that, no one will ever agree. You know, you can't. there's no one who everyone will agree with their perspective. So they didn't end up doing anything, I assume. No, they didn't. And then in 2020 or 2019, um, my, my Diksha Guru said to me on the phone, are you the Cedar Party who wrote that article about the annotations back in the day? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that was me. And he said, because, you know, it came up again in Mayapur this year and they pulled that paper out and said, this is why we shouldn't do it. Whoa. And so they were still using the arguments in there to defeat the push for it. Do you remember, sidebar, mm. when I was in college, my last year of university, I did a paper on Darwinism and Darwinism and something else. And I was conversing over with email with you about it. Really? Yeah. This okay. was in 2004 or five, maybe even. Wow. Okay. No, no, no. It would have been 2008 or nine. Yeah. And you gave me a lot of like, I still think I still have the paper. It's like a 40 page paper, like my final thing. Mm. And you helped me a lot on that. But it was completely because I knew you had written a lot of Darwin stuff on Planet Iskon. Yeah. That happened because I joined this technology company, my day job. Yeah. And then there was this guy there and he was like a Wikipedia category editor. Like, you know, he's like the, the guy in charge of a particular category, you know, like yeah. super like in-depth nerdy kind of guy. And um, I was having a conversation with him about evolution, right? And yeah. then I was just pulling all the moves that you do in the dojo, you know, the morning Bhagavatam class, you know, with the brahmacharis, <laughs> smashing, you know, kicking in that rascal Darwin's face, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bringing all the arguments, you know? And he was bringing up all the stuff that I'd never heard of, like ring species and a bunch of stuff. And, and eventually he said to me, he said, I don't think you understand what you're arguing against. Like, and so I was like, from that Brahmana and Vaishnava essay that was written by Srila Bhakti Saranta Saraswati Thakur, where he first of all demonstrates his opponent's argument about the Brahmanas, you know, how great they are. Mm -hmm. So the Brahmanas presented their side of it. Then he gets up and he presents their side of it, but he presents it better than they did, like yeah, evidence yeah. that they'd never even heard of. Yeah. And they're like, damn, this is good, you know? <laughs> but then he switches to his refutation right. or his extension of it that refutes it. Vaishnavas in the second half. So I was like, I should understand... You know, Stephen Covey says, first understand before you seek to be understood, right? Yes. I'm a bit more, I'm, I'm less agreeable. I'm like, first understand, then refute. Mm. So I read uh, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. And then I became a bit of a Dawkins kind of fan and read like everything I could get my hands on of his for... for God delusion and stuff. The God delusion I haven't read. Really? No. I didn't read that one. Mm-hmm. I found his arguments, uh, I found his arguments about atheism to be like, uh, overstating his case and a lot of re rhetoric rather than yeah. reasoning. But I wanted to understand this modern kind of neo-Darwinistic perspective. And I found a lot of, um, a way of understanding, a way of understanding that, that you can, there's just different ways of looking at things, you know, in science, you can look at things as like relativity or quantum you know, there's just different models that you can use. Yeah. You know, flat plane geography or curved surface. And there are different approximations and stuff. And some of the things in the selfish gene are straight out of Bhagavad Gita. You know, like about the material nature produces. Um, the material nature is the source of all sarva, kar no, um, karna, karya, karna, kartrit, ve hete prakriti ruchate. Mm -hmm. Um, that the material nature is said to be the source of all causes and effects and causes and effects means material bodies. And so he has demonstrated a, a mechanism by which the material energy can produce all of the causes and effects, the different vehicles for the living entities to incarnate into. It of course becomes, um, irreconcilable or just simply a different model when you hit like a Puranic history thing about like Lord Brahma and the Prajapadis and, and then that's another way of looking at it. Mm. We were talking about annotations and you were 
How did we get to annotations? So annotations and my defense of Shula Prabhupada's <coughs> books against annotations was my, you know, my like, if I die now oh, in this right. incarnation, I did my job, you know? Right, right. And then that podcast came out yeah. and I was like two in a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude. <laughs> nice. Nice. I'm glad I could be a part of that. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, that was good. Um, the the moon landing. Yeah. Chandrayaan 3, India, yeah. lands on the moon. Yeah, I know. And then devotees are coming out with the picture of the Atari moon lander. And, and like, <laughs> Atari moon lander. <laughs> yeah, the Atari graphics moon lander. And they're like, here's the proof that, the, that you know, Srila Prabhupada was wrong about the moon landings being faked in 1969. Wait, someone said that? Yeah, yeah. A Prabhupada disciple. What? A bunch of people were like that. They were like, see, this goes to prove that all you moon landing denying conspiracy theorists yeah. were wrong because India just landed on the moon and proved it. Yeah. There, so, so there were a few pictures which were that cartoon, like Atari thing, mm -hmm. but then someone showed me a photo that supposedly that moon lander thing took. Yeah. Well, there you go. That and it was a, it right there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a really bad photo. And yeah. I was like, you guys can't do any better than this. Like just they, strap they, an they, iPhone they, to they, that thing. And just they like, don't have to, because people you see, don't believe it based on Pratyaksha. Yes. Yes. They just don't. And, and they know that and they don't even have to pretend. They just have to pretend that they're pretending. Yeah. And people will buy it. It's enough for them to buy it. Like it's simply, um, brute force you know people buy it because the the existential cost of questioning it is too high the other monkeys in the in the cage are all going to bash you if you try to get the bananas yeah you know and then and then the other thing is like what do you really gain by like looking into that you know do you really want to know do you really want to do you really want to do you really want to pull the veil back on that the devotees that i saw who had a good take on it where that was that it's a distraction. You don't need to, because it's so much conflicting <laughs> information in the sense of Prabhupada said a number of things about it. He didn't just say we didn't land on it. He said, he said a few things about it. Do you, do you know that? Yeah. So their, <clears throat> so their point is that why are you looking into that? It's a distraction. Like our goal in Krishna consciousness is not to prove or disprove that someone went on the moon or not. It's that we have, we're Chan Hare Krishna and we want to serve Krishna and get Krishna Prema. Yeah. It's easy to say that, oh, Prabhupada said, you know, a number of different things. It's another thing to actually go and read them and study them to understand Srila Prabhupada's position on it. What do you mean? Um, you know, like you asked me like, oh, did you know that Srila Prabhupada said different things about the moon landing? You know, for example, he said, I've always said that they have not gone. He said, he said that at one point. Yeah. And, 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 and several times, you know, right up to 75, 76, he's like simply cheating. They're doing it in Arizona in the desert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, he also said, well, you know, even if they have gone there, you know, then it's simply a waste of time. Yes. And, you know, he said, you know, someone's like, you know, maybe they landed on like Rahu or something. And he's, so you see Srila Prabhupada, he didn't reason from, Srila Prabhupada wasn't reasoning from these pictures of fake how could they do it? The technology, the Van Allen belts, the kind of things that the mundane moon landing conspiracy deniers may arrive there through this ascending process, right? Of observation and um, inference. Yeah. Logical deduction. Srila Prabhupada started at the other end. That, you know, there are two things there. One is that according to the Bhagavat Purana, the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the moon is further away than the sun. So therefore yes. their claim that they have a model of the universe where the moon is closer than the sun and based on that model, they went there. They should have discovered that the moon is further away than the sun if they actually went. Yeah. There's some quote, if they were to, Prabhupada said, if they were to go to the moon, it would take them like 4,000 years to get there according to their, you know, 400 miles per hour shuttle or whatever it was. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have to agree with it. Now, the first thing to get about that is that's a particular way of thinking. Yeah. And it's, and it's the supremacy of Shastra Praman and then the subordination of Pratyaksha and Anuman to that. So it's like, you know, they, they show you a picture and say, we went to the moon and Srila Prabhupada's like, I don't even need to look at the picture to know that you're lying. 
And then when people do look at the picture, there's a very strong argument that, you know, these pictures are all fake, you know, and there's like lots of inconsistencies you can find when you look into them. Mm. And then you go looking into it further and you find all, all kinds of other, you know, aspects of it that are problematic. Like, you know, we were talking earlier about chat GPT and artificial intelligence, the introduction of the internet, the introduction of the cell phones, another example, you know, here's this new technology that comes in and then it just gets developed to the nth degree and exploited. And there's like a massive competition and innovation takes place. And 50 years later, the technology is like unrecognizable to people from 50 years ago. It's now like magic, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. But the moon landing doesn't demonstrate anything like that at all. And, you know, like if they could exploit that, they would exploit it. Put garbage there, put people there. Put, put weapons there, put a, a big laser, whatever, you know, yeah, like yeah. take, you know, use it to control the. That's a really good point. Yeah. But you have to have this, this, uh, Parokshavad, like reaching around here. No, the reason was that the reason that they went to the moon was because of the political situation to beat the Russians. And then they, you know, and then that went away. And so the driver for them to go there was gone. Yeah. But nobody has ever needed any kind of driver like that to go and explore and exploit foreign lands. Whenever they can get there, they have to have a treaty for Antarctica to stop anyone from going there. Right. Mm. There's like this massive cooperation between these nations. They might be at war in other areas, but for some reason they all agree that no one can see the ice wall in Antarctica or the crashed UFO that's there or whatever it is you know, <laughs> that they're hiding, the, the hole to the center of the earth or whatever it is in Antarctica. Yeah. You know, but with the moon, supposedly we just flew there in 1969 with this thing that had a computer that's like, you know, all of the computers in NASA at the time are not even equal to my phone. It's mind blowing. And, you know, somehow they're able to like ring the, you know, the moon on a landline. Um, but in the intervening, what would that be? 1970, 53 years since then. Yeah. The, you know, the state of the art now is this Chandrayaan moon landing narrative. That's more consistent with they faked it than that it was actually real. That's, this is from the ascending process yeah, of yeah. just inference and like comparison. But Srila Prabhupada didn't start from there. He started from you know, several factors in this whole story contradict the, the Shastric narrative. And Srila Prabhupada says explicitly that I am den I, I'm, I'm challenging this because if what they say is true, it discredits all of this. And that's just simply unacceptable. It's, it's the statements of the Shastra versus your statements. Mm. And he said, you are accepting the word of a 10 cent newspaper. The 10 cent newspaper tells you they went to the moon and you simply believe it. You know, 10 cent newspaper Uvacha, the moon landing is real. And he's like, the Srimad Bhagavatam tells me that what they're saying is a lie. So therefore they're cheating. Hmm. And then Chandrayaan comes out, you know, there's a conversation where Srila Prabhupada says, you know, they mentioned that Mars, you know, from the land, it looks just like Arizona. Prabhupada is like, why he is taking the name Arizona? That means that they are doing this in Arizona. Yeah. He said, he said, just like when a burglar might go into a house and he's, and he says, I'm not stealing. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and yeah. they're like, but we didn't ask you if you're stealing or not, but he just outed himself Yeah, by saying, I'm not stealing. So right after Chandrayaan lands, it's a big news story. You can Google it, you know, and find it. And it's like, you know, Canadian newspaper, um, mistakes uh crater in arizona for the moon yes yes you know, they, they just they're, they're mocking the real business probably their real business is in arizona yeah <laughs> they're, 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 and they're mocking people because they know that the people who will believe the 10 cent newspaper need nothing more than the fact that the 10 cent newspaper told them that that's what they should be saying they just they just learn their lines as unpaid extras on the show from the from the television that goes back to that point of integrating with society. Like I see, I saw on Facebook so many ISKCON temples in India mm -hmm. posting about this is Krishna's blessing upon India that we have landed on the moon and we celebrated, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. There, I don't think there was anyone from India officially saying this, come on, this can't happen. You ready for the conspiracy theory about that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're like, do I really want to no, go No, no, because I was going to say if I have anything, uh, if I had any other thoughts about that. Uh -huh. No, but I was just surprised that, I, I wasn't that surprised, but it, there was like some political thing there too that 
no one was saying anything against it but uh, but you know with gusto like india it's about india and yeah. their accomplishments bodily consciousness that's what it's for it's for um creating and elevating a group identity around a, a bodily designation right as a means of like um politically controlling and shaping the order of the world elevating different nations and their status and their leadership in the political, socio-political and economic spheres. Um, but the, the conspiracy theory about that, I was looking at it and you remember that, that just prior to that, there was a whole thing in the news about how Amara or Amala had criticized, um, Radha Krishna, Vivekananda, Vivekananda. Oh, Amogalila. Amogalila. Right, he'd criticized. He'd criticized uh, Vivekananda, Vivekananda in Calcutta. He was giving a cl he was giving class and no, he was giving a speech somewhere in public in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he said that what kind of a saint eats fish, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then he kind of he also mocked him by saying in a Bengali accent, um, it was like yat pat tat pat or something like that. Yat tat tat pat. Yeah. Yeah, and he said it with a, a Bengali accent. Yeah, yeah. You know, doing an impression. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like whatever path you take, you know, that is like the path. Right? Yeah, all all paths lead to the same goal. Yeah. So he was kind of mocking that aspect of Vivek, Vivekananda's presentation. And there was a huge backlash. You remember that? Yes. And it was like in all the news and everything. And then what they did was they, the temple president somewhere there released a statement saying that, you know, he's recanted. He's going to take a vow of silence, you know, in order to... Um, Priyashita. Atone for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Prius shit. Yeah. And this is all, the, the, all that stuff is like made up concoction. None of that is our core Krishna consciousness business. Like where any of this come from? Right. That Prabhupada tells one of his, you know, some bold preacher, you know, might've crossed a line or whatever, you know, to take a vow of silence. What is this? You know, concoction. Um, Backpedals on the whole thing, right? backpedaling oh no we don't want to offend anyone or anything like that right yeah the very next thing that comes out is an article that says you know um you know this amogalila das he has said this thing but the fa the movement's founder has made even stronger statements mm. and they publish an article <laughs> with Srila Prabhupada going even harder on so, Vivekananda yeah yeah and so instead of just backing backing our guy backing Prabhupada and just saying like you know look all respect to people who have made a contribution to this country and everything, but it is a fact that whatever, restate your position. Yeah. Now people are dealing with us. They're dealing with the the um, the stand that we are in the world. And that's Srila Prabhupada's mood. And they like walked away from Srila Prabhupada. What are you going to say in defense or, you know, in, re in response to that newspaper article? Because you already went out in public and blew your whole thing. Yeah. Rather than being like, and then they're like, these guys are hardcore. And it turns out that they're, they're just doing what their founder did. But no, they didn't do that. Mm. But the lesson that got communicated there was, if you, if you insult India's national pride, we will crush you in the court of public opinion. Mm. And if that's important to you, and if you don't think you have what it takes to weather that, you better not say anything against Chandrayaan. Because if you do, we're going to go back and we're going to pull out all of the quotes from your founder, Acharya, about, you know, and then show him to be completely like bonkers conspiracy theorist. Mm. And so there's no way that temples in India did not have the Amogalila Vivekananda incident and the backlash from that top of mind when the, when the, the theatrical production of Chandrayaan is being rolled out, you know? I was watching it happen and, you know, they show the computer graphics and then everybody stands up and cheers. And then Narendra Modi is standing there looking into the camera, waving an Indian flag. And the announcer is saying, Prime Minister Narendra, and I'm not going to do the accent. <laughs> <laughs> next thing you know, you're going to get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Prime Minister, oh, it's so tempting to do it, but Prime Minister Narendra Modi is here to personally inspect the like veracity of the landing. They literally said that. So they respect the veracity. Yeah. The like he's perfectly there. He's personally there overseeing. So it's like, I'm not watching the landing. I'm watching the prime minister of India, watching the landing and telling me that it's real. That's right. what you were watching. Yes, yes, yes. And so the Vivek, the Vivekananda Amogalila 
incident was part of the coordinated campaign to get this over and suppress. Because if you take that, let's take it as a hypothesis that it's faked and that it's part of a theatrical production to bewilder the minds of the common pop populace, right? Yeah. The Asuras will accuse us of the same thing. You guys bewilder the minds of people by telling them about this Lord Vishnu who doesn't exist. He's not real. It's just imaginary friend, fictitious stories. And then you use that to manipulate the minds of the people to take the money off them and to, to amass power. That's what the Asuras accuse us of. Why do they accuse us of that? Because that is literally what they are doing and they think we're doing the same thing. But they don't back away from that. They don't back away from that. And we don't back away from saying that the, the theatrical moon production is a theatrical production, but let's take it as a hypothesis. If, if it is, then part of rolling it out would involve identifying, you know, groups within the society that could undermine that. And ISKCON India repeating Srila Prabhupada's denial of the American moon landing would have been a real undermining of it because part of the protection of the whole thing was that this is not about cheap computer graphics. This is about racism and colonialism. The white people, I wanted to do the accent again. This is <laughs> one, one Y on it's called W I O N. <coughs> you know, um, the UK is, is envious of, of India's achievements. Now that we have also gone to the moon and, and, and the UK, the British have never done it. Right. And so they're criticizing that why we have spent the money on doing this thing yes. when we could have done sanitation. But the real question is, where is the $45 trillion that Britain extracted from India during colonialism? Mm. And so now you've changed the whole conversation. Yeah. It's not about the quality of the evidence or any of that now. Mm. It's about national pride, national identity, racism, colonialism, reparations, you know? Look at the look at the other side of what's, what's something might be happening from the from looking at it face value but there's something from behind that's happening exactly it's a it's a it's a social um mind shaping you know they're they they're telling stories to people to contextualize their existence and we do the same thing in the bhagavatam class we're trying to unwind it they come and sit in the bhagavatam class and then you read you know Srila Prabhupada and his purport saying you know here's the reasons why they can't go to the moon because the sun is further away Sorry, the moon is further away than the sun. Do I have any way of verifying that? Like empirically? No. Does anyone? But then you see, they make the claim that the moon is closer than the sun and your average man in the street, devotee or otherwise, has no way of verifying or validating that. It's all a question of where you place your faith. Yeah. Do you place it in these mundane scientists or in the Bhagavatam and Srila Prabhupada? And I think saying that, well, Srila Prabhupada said a lot of things as a cop-out. It's a question of looking at what he did say and understanding what his actual position is. And he he's a moon landing denier. Yeah. Front and center. When I think about this, I, I, I just see that there's two types of devotees. Or maybe there's like a spectrum. But mm -hmm. like I think of the main two types. One, one who wants to integrate into society and... Like I said in the beginning of this episode, mm -hmm. and then the ones who don't care about integration and even will actually try to even disintegrate themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know what's a powerful um, psychological driver for that? And this takes us to another point um, in the conversation is um, when you have children, you suddenly desire a stable social environment around you to raise them in. You know, when you're like a single and young and you're like, you know, in your twenties and you have no, you know, you just like, you know, bring down the system, you know, you're into that yeah, revolution, you know, like yeah. something that's never been done before, you know, make my contribution. So you got all these kind of psychological drivers that feed into that phase of life, missionary zeal, you know, revolution, a new system, and then you get married and you have children. And now you've got like a whole world of concerns around that. And you know, you want like the maximum amount of social stability around that situation. And so, you know, you, you kind of like hope for, um, stability, 
maintenance, the ongoing status quo type situation. So, you know, you become less inclined to revolution at that point. Yeah, that's, def that's definitely true, being a father myself. Although, I do want, like, the kind of struggles that I had in life, like, that's something about homeschooling that I talk to my wife about a lot, is that my kids are not necessarily going to go through some of the struggles that I went to that make me the person that I am today. Like, with whether it be... Talk, you know, talking to people about my faith or mm. just being different. But if it's always like with with my kids right now, what it is that you know, there it's just on an atmosphere of everything's familiar, everything's comfortable, everything's nice. There's no real challenges yet. I mean, my oldest is five, so it's not he's not older yet. So, but I think it builds character when there's some kind of te not tension, but a little bit of like struggle when it comes to identity and relationships and things like that. Yeah. I mean, um, my son Prahlad, he, he's 21 now. And I mean, at various times he was like, why couldn't you have called me, um, a name like Steve? Really? Yeah. Because imagine this as an experience of life, right? Yeah. Yeah. Every single time you say your name to someone, their immediately response is what? Yes. Like that every single time. And then after a while, because it's such a core kind of like part of your identity and being seen in the world. Yeah. You have the experience of like not being seen, right? Yes. And then you become so resigned about it that you don't even bother saying it anymore because you know, they're not going to get it anyway. Yeah. So you just say whatever something and then, you know, predictably the thing goes. So I saw that happen to him as an experience of life, you know? Yeah. And he was like, why couldn't I have had a name like Steve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, at a certain point. What was your answer? You just don't. Yeah. Right. That's just, your name is Prahlad. <coughs> but, you know, at, at some point in the future, you know, that may become, um, may become more integrated for him as like, because there are things about myself now that, I was deeply uncomfortable about when I was a teenager and at school and made me different from everyone else. Yeah. But now distinguish me in the world as an adult and like a part of my individual character. Totally. Totally. And, and, you know, I can own those about myself now, but I resisted them for the longest time. Yeah. And so if you add being a Hare Krishna, you know, to, to that as an experience of life, being different, you know, from everyone else. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I like that a lot. I think that, yeah, like in your son's example, it could be something right now or whenever it was that, uh, why couldn't you name me Steve? But when he gets older, like what, maybe what happened to you, this is something great and this is who I am. And yeah. I've, but he had to come to that. And that's something I get concerned about with my kids that it should be, there should be some type of trials and tribulations to to build character and, and things like that but how to do that when when the kid lives such a sheltered life already and you want them to be happy and comfortable so there has to be like some kind of experimental tribulations or something or does it happen on its own i don't know maybe it does yeah it's kind of like you know i grow up and um i'm one of four and the eldest of four. Oh, really yeah oh nice i didn't know that yeah and i grew up with um um, just my mother raising us. So she was oh. a single mother. Oh, wow. Yeah. My dad was like kind of in and out and wasn't too involved. Yeah. So, um, I kind of was like a single mother, you know, state housing, um, raising four kids. And, uh, so I was kind of like, you know, all the things that I missed out on in my life, I'll make sure that my son gets. Yes. And, and we would have had more children. Um, but that was, they actually doctors told us we would never be able to have any children. Mm. So Prahlad was really a miracle. Um, but I was like, I'll make sure he gets all the things that I missed out on having. But then the experience of creating that for him creates a different set of problems. Yeah. And now the issue is that I kind of understand myself and the responses that I had to life in the face of the problems that I had. And then I took away all those kind of problems for him, gave him a different set of problems. 
and now have a son who has an experience of life that is nothing like my own growing up. Yeah. And so now I'm like, kind of like, I can't even look to myself and the way I solve things to say, Hey, here's what you do. You know, just do this. He's a completely different person yeah. with a completely different life trajectory to this point. And it's, it, it is, and it is a mystery to me exactly you know, what to do. Did you know that he was going to have an ex a completely different experience? Because my tendency is that I want him to have the same experience that I had. But I just recently figured out that, no, it's going to be completely different because nothing's the same. Yeah. Did you know that he was going to have a completely different experience? Did you have that this is thought? Only, or? When this is only looking, kind of looking back now. You oh, know? looking back now, yeah. I can just see myself, like, as we were going through things, attending to making sure that he didn't experience the things that I did that I found particularly challenging growing up. But like you say, it's those challenges that actually create your character, you know, the fire of adversity. Yeah. But yeah, I can see myself, you know, taking those or creating. And then, so, you know, maybe it's like overprotective, you know, yeah. Um, rather than exposing him to the challenges, like cutting the, the butterfly out of the chrysalis kind of thing. Yeah. Having a daughter was really different than having sons. Mm -hmm. And I remember you were just saying how you inherited a daughter. Yeah. How's it been? How has that been? Um, <laughs> there was a certain point with Prahlad where I kind of became conscious that I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and part of that also was kind of like, because my father wasn't around to model to me right. what to do, I can't just like, I'm just going to do what he did. Cause I'm kind of like, I'm not doing what he did, you know? Yeah. But I don't know what to do. So with Prahlad, I kind of like had that feeling and that thought and that con as a concern, background concern going on. And then, um, you know, in my, in my second marriage, my first wife, if people have seen the second episode we did, Parambhava, she left her body after 24 years of marriage. That's Prahlad's uh, mother. Yeah. And then I met my now wife, Donna Davy at the parliament occupation. Um, which was a very strong filter for finding someone with a similar values and mm -hmm. level of commitment. Totally you know? strong filter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we got married and then she brings from her first marriage, uh, a daughter, Isabella, who's now 15 was 14. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, okay, I, I have no, um, idea of how to, <coughs> how to parent a, a girl. And now like, you know, okay, from zero to, to having a daughter and she's already 13 and I'm missing all of that kind of like relatedness that you'll build, you know, and then you kind yeah. of go on a journey with that child and there's like a whole background of shared kind of experience and investment and yeah. the relationship. And so it was kind of like, I call it like doing life in advanced mode, you know? Mm. And then at the same time being thrust into living in the country and having animals and like living in a tent and it was, it was a lot. Um, but yeah, it's been challenging and confronting. It's another type of adversity, you know, mm -hmm. um, and having to deal with my own sense of inadequacy and get that out of the way. Yeah. A lot of the time, and just to link this back to another thing, you know, I think that this desire to be accepted in society and have people like validate us and like, yeah, the Hare Krishna is, it's kind of sometimes predicated on, you know, consequentialists, like in order to achieve the mission, you know, this is the way we do it. Um, but it can also be driven, um, by, by an individual psychology. And so you can be attracted to this by a sense of inadequacy and a need for external validation. And, um, I think that gets in the way of parenting as well, rather than like doing the right thing and being a stand for the right thing. You kind of want your children to like you, you know, or you don't want to be known as a bad parent kind of thing. Yeah. And that can lead to this, um, permissive style of parenting. So you got like permissive and then you got like, um, authoritarian where you just tell them what to do, you know? Mm-hmm. And you can have like combinations, you know, you have one permissive parent, one authoritarian parent, mm -hmm. and then the kid's like really messed up. Mm. And then there's like being like authoritative. And 
some of what's involved in that is like getting out of the way, the concerns that, that you have for being inadequate yourself, you know, not mentaling out about it. Like if you have the devotion of no mind, jnana shunya bhakti, and you just like go out there and chant, and you're not even thinking about what people think about what you're wearing. You're just wearing whatever you're wearing and you're chanting the holy name. Yeah. And then it doesn't matter what you're wearing. But if you're thinking about why you should be wearing Western clothes or why, you know, you should be wearing these other clothes or why it's weird that you're, you're not thinking about chanting, you're not, you know, purely engaged in being out there glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead and making him available to others. And in that way, you know, um, through that service, gaining some uh, small um, access yourself, you, you're doing something else. And, and it's the same with parenting as well. That's my conclusion about it is like, um, and then working with, with my wife, Donna Davey, you know, we're both very different. We like, in some ways we're like on the same page, you know, we were both at parliament. Yeah. She was like mandated out of her job, you know, mm -hmm. she left the city to go and live in the country to fulfill on Srila Prabhupada's, you know, next phase of the mission of like going back to the land and protecting cows. And so, you know, we're like fully, you know compatible in that area and then there are other areas where we're like really in different worlds you know mm. like completely ships passing in the night <laughs> two complete different visions of reality and what's going on yeah and then the kind of like discovering how to co-parent um these two children because <laughs> right. she has the same thing to deal with with prelad that she's never had a son and she suddenly inherits the son who's 20 at the time wow what a challenge hey it's yeah. like doing life in advanced mode. Yeah. Yeah. And then we got married after like meeting, like it was like an arranged marriage, you know, where you like meet them once or twice and then get married. Why was it so quick? It was just very clear for both of you. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I sometimes go back and look at it and I was like, you know, the sense of inadequacy, you know, is there, cause I, I look at my character, you know, my individual psychology, like, you know, what my drivers are, you know, like people had explanations of my chanting at, um, parliament. For example, one devotee said, oh, you just, uh, love to be the center of attention. They said that to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you love to be the center of attention. That's why, you know, you yeah. got in there and did this thing. And, um, someone else said, you know, oh, you have a problem with authority because of, you know, the, your relationship with your father. And so you're just like a rebel against any kind of authority. Yeah. So there are like these individual psychological explanations of my character that, um, so I'm always looking at those kind of things as well, you know? Yeah. But none of those things about, you know, my relationship with my father growing up, um, you know, my introversion or extroversion or, you know, am I an exhibitionist narcissist, you know? Um, none of that has anything to do with chanting the holy name in protests. That's actually the duty of everyone. That was uh, Parikshit Maharaj's question. Like, what's the duty of everyone, and specifically those who are about to die? And it's to always glorify, remember the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Hari, his name, fame, and glory. And it doesn't matter what you're thinking, you know, whatever your motivation is that gets you there, or whatever you think your motivation is when you're doing it. And to wrap that back around to to, to the parenting thing, you know, I, and, and, and the getting married so fast, you know, I look at it and I'm like, um, divine arrangement or, um, you know, some kind of like psychological inadequacy. I have to say that I was very grateful, um, at the way that that all came together. Um, Wait, what came to together? Meeting Donna Davy at oh, oh, Parliament oh. and then getting married like a month later. Yeah. It was just like that. Um, yeah. I, I, I couldn't, I, I could, I could give a number of psychological explanations for the whole thing, but it's yeah. just what happened, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And now we're just continuing to discover what it takes to serve together in this complex situation, you know, co-parenting <coughs> with two children. Yeah. Um, you know, we're keen to have more children, both of us. Nice. Always have wanted to. Yeah. Um, we'll see what Krishna, you know, makes possible for us. 
Yeah. There's a lot like challenges involved in that. Mm-hmm. You also um, recently a movie came out about the protests. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So yeah. And uh, what and what's the significance to you? Yeah. Of, about that. Sure. So this movie is like uh, playing in cinemas across New Zealand right now. They're making an international edition to come out more broadly, but it's crushing it in the box office right now. Mm -hmm. um, it was number one um, a week or two ago in the box office with like no mainstream publicity or anything, independently produced. It's a documentary movie about the convoy that happened in New Zealand and then the 21 day occupation of the parliament gardens there. And devotees featured prominently in the occupation and they pr feature prominently in the movie. There's a, there's a real correspondence with the reality of the um, participation of the devotees and the contribution of the, that the Hare Krishna devotees made in the Freedom Village and how it's presented in the movie. Mm -hmm. 3,000 plates of prashadam every day distributed, um, kirtan going on 10 to 12 hours a day for 21 days. We just did the Prabhupada malady only. Really? Yeah. I remember Gauravani, when he came to Australia, he was talking about, yeah, we had this crazy idea. We'd do a 24 hour kirtan and it would all be just the classic. I've Prabhupada heard him say that before. Yeah. Yeah. So we went with it and we did it for 21 That's days. That's awesome. And as a result of that, everybody started singing it. It was the soundtrack of the occupation. That's amazing. And you can hear it in the, uh, in the movie. Yeah. And, and for people it like, um, yeah, it was just incredible. Why is it such a big hit? Why is it in, such a big in hit? New, in, in New Zealand? In New Zealand? Um, just because it was, I mean, it was a big deal. I know that, but. Yeah. Well, I'm going to sound, I'm, I'm going to just be straight up. I'm a card carrying conspiracy theorist, right? Right. Like these are just hypotheses. Let's throw this out as a hypothesis, right? The Rockefeller 2010 scenarios for the future development of technology and society has a scenario in there called lockstep about a pandemic, the response and it looks pretty much exactly like what we saw happen in 2020 to 22, you know, right. 23. And it ends with growing dissatisfaction and pushback from the citizenry against the authoritarian top-down control. So in other words, the, the scenario that they modeled that matches everything that's been done up to this point includes at the end of it, a blowback phase. Mm. So the blowback is like a natural kind of outgrowth of it. And this movie is part of that. And, and uh, having studied that scenario back in 2020, I knew the blowback was coming. Right. And I was like, we need to make sure that the chanting of the holy name is part of that. So that's why, among other things, that was what, what I and others were thinking while we were participating. We were just like, we are commanded to chant the holy name in any and all circumstances. <coughs> we can't allow there to be thousands, tens of thousands of people congregating you know, in a highly volatile situation in our country without adding the chanting of the holy name to it. It's just simply a, a duty. There's, there's a word in Te Reo Māori, kaitiaka, kaitiaki, which means uh, kaitiaki is like a guardian or a steward. And the Vaishnavas, as the stewards of humanity, of their s spiritual safety and well-being, it's our job to get out there and add the chanting of the holy name to absolutely everything that's going on. Mm. That's the, the astra, Sangha Pang Astra Parshadam, yeah. the, the weapon of the, uh, of the Kali Yuga. And that's the weapon that we're wielding. And, you know, we went and chanted it and we did that and it got forged into this movie, which contains the chanting of the Maha Mantra. And that movie is now a sword. And so what we were doing there in parliament was we were forging that sword and it's been forged into this movie it's crushing it in the box office in New Zealand and it's going to go from there internationally. Wow. And, and it's going to be the spearhead of this kind of blowback to the authoritarianism, to the corruption that's being revealed to the, the kinds of things we talked to in that podcast that we did back in 2021, you know, yeah. the, 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 the lack of the science application of the actual scientific method, overstating the certainty of claims Mm. denying, you know, any kind of like, um, doubt to statements, you know, like yeah. this is the truth and it's, yeah, that's all starting to come out now. It's all starting to come unraveled and this movie will, will, will fuel this blowback and it has the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra in it. Interestingly, 
when devotees were at these protests, not everyone supported that chanting there. Yeah, a lot of people were um, dead set against it. Why is that? <clears throat> I guess it goes back to my integration. Yeah, the, uh, the this concern for something other than doing the thing and letting the chips fall where they may. Yes. You know, rather than like, you know, we serve the supreme personality of Godhead and we know that we win on this planet and we don't care what you think. Mm. That's attractive. People like that. Yeah, because if you don't think that way, then you're actually bending, bow, the, knee. You're bending the knee to someone else. Yeah. Not to the, not to Krishna or, or yeah. Yeah. Or, or we, God. We serve Lord Vishnu. Right. And we're not afraid of anything. Yeah. It's like if, you know, if your dad is like, you know, it's like, you're not afraid of any of the kids in the playground. Right. It's yeah. like, my dad <laughs> yeah. will beat all of you up. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So when you're serving Lord Vishnu, it's like, people should think that we're crazy. It's Prabhupada's, you know, who's crazy thing, right? These people, they're weird. They wear these weird clothes. They're not doing what everyone else is doing. They're saying that the moon landing is faked. You know, they won't stop chanting. They don't care. They don't think this other thing is more important than chanting. It was a test. It wasn't simply an IQ test. It was a test on whether you think something else is more important than chanting. And also whether you think that chanting can have a negative uh, consequence. Yeah, there's very less customers to the diamond shop, right? Like the diamond shop, you're not going to have so many customers. So when I think, okay, we do want a widespread Krishna consciousness, integrate, etc., but you're not going to have, you're not going to have, what do you mean integrate? Meaning like, um, I guess the point I'm making is that we can, you know, let the chips fall as they may. And people who are generally inquisitive and ready for Krishna consciousness will come and they'll take to it. But it's not that everyone, we have to kind of spread this huge net that everyone will appreciate it and everyone will want to join Krishna consciousness. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Let me like, see. Let me see if I can if I can capture it. So you're positing that there are two different like extremes ends of a spectrum. Yes. And one end of the spectrum is like just doing the thing, no matter what anyone thinks, and not who cares, right? Yes. And then at the other end of the spectrum is, um, you know, not trying to offend people and to make it easy to yeah okay that's called simping. <laughs> That's literally what this, you're describing. Right, right. You're describing simping. You yeah. don't get the girl by simping. Right. You get the girl by being a straight savage. <laughs> because if you look at it, back in the 60s and 70s, they just went straight savage. We don't care what you think. Yes. We're here to take over the world, and it was growing like crazy. Do you think it's not growing like crazy because we're simping? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Simping is simping, yeah. That's like a very young person term. Simping. What does it mean? Um, it's kind of like the idea that by being agreeable, yes. by being nice, agreeable, you'll get the girl. Nice. Yes. And it's at the opposite extreme now to wield this all together. Like Srila Prabhupada says in, in that purport that although it is illegal, it is a fact that a woman loves a man who is the expert at rape. They just absolutely do. And, 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 you know, a, a, um, so to, because this is going to be super controversial, you know, to bring this up. Yeah. Um, so to be responsible for this, it's like this, if she doesn't love it, you're not expert at it is the bottom line there, man. <laughs> <laughs> But look, the fact is that that's just the, look, I, I went to live on a farm now, you know, and I, we got chickens and roosters and, you know, the, like, there's no like, you know, whining and dining or, you know, carrying a handbag going <laughs> oh on there. God. And the chickens are just like, throw them off. You know, if the guy's not expert at it, he ain't getting any and they love the <laughs> one that's expert at it. Right? <coughs> and then that's in the animal kingdom. And it's like encoded into them, encoded into their psychology. Mm. People respect a powerful, you know, this is the description of Lord Kalki in the, um, I think it's the symptoms of Kali Yuga, 12th canto, second chapter. Mm. And it describes the son of uh, Vishnu Yashas, 
who comes in Kalki avatar. And then in the purport, it says everybody, you know, loves a, a powerful figure, righteous figure, you know, riding on a horse, wielding a sword, punishing the wrongdoers. Yeah. Oh, they love it. You know, <laughs> people love that stuff. They're drawn to that. You know, it's like the, um, the most powerful positions, the most committed are the ones that are attractive to people. I feel that I agree. There's also a whole section of people that we will just marginalize. What do you mean by marginalize? Like they won't even give you the time of day if you say, if you just give it straight. When there's a little bit of simping involved, then it's like, oh, okay, we're ears to this. And then some a little bit of Krishna consciousness can be injected with that opening. Yeah. Um, I love that we're using the word simping. It's so funny. Yeah. It, <laughs> let's call it for what it is, man. <laughs> you know, the thing with that is, though, that if there are a lot of people out there who are waiting to be activated, see if you, it's a, this is a complete different mindset shift, right? Who we are is we are the demigods. And we've come down to this planet in order to take it over for Lord Vishnu and take it back off the Asuras who have control of it. And amongst the human population are other demigods and great sages who have also taken birth on this planet to do this. And our job is to go out and reactivate them all and then lead the humans in battle against the Asuras. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. Mm. There's no integration fitting in. It's recruiting, organizing, and then carrying out the mission. Mm. And the weapon that we use is the holy name. And our political, organ social organization, economic organization is Va Daivi Van Ashram Dharma, the scientific division of society into the four orders, um, material or, you know, the four kind of active activity orders and, and the four spiritual orders or life cycle orders. So the, the Brahmana, the Kshatriya, the Vaishya and the Shudra are the four kind of social and economic activities political economic activities. The Brahmanas are the spiritual intellectuals. They're detached and they provide guidance. They don't care what people think. Yeah. They're not about popularity. They're about doing what it says in the Shastra. Then you have the Chatriyas. Yeah, they care about popularity to some degree because they need to secure influence over the population. They're the executive leaders, kings, administrators. Then you have your, your Vaishas, they're the, the belly of the, so the Brahmanas are the head, the Chhatriyas are the arms, the Vaishas are the belly. They're responsible for the production of food, which is the fundamental economic question. And then there are the Shudras who are, they, they support the others and they provide um, service to them. Yeah. And so that's our system for organization. We're anti-democratic. There's no integration into democracy. We're dedicated to the dismantle, dismantling of democracy and basically the introduction of like, what people would call a caste system. And, you know, history goes through these phases where, you know, the caste system, the Daivi Van Ashram deteriorates into a caste system, which is the oppression or exploitation of one caste, one group by another. Yeah. And then instead of guna and karma, it becomes quality and activity. It becomes janma, bodily identification. Uh, and then that whole system becomes corrupted and then it needs to be overturned. And then, you know, you have something like democracy come and democratization and that's a good thing. And then we arrive at where we are now, which is where democracy has become so corrupt. It's so obviously a sham. It's so obviously an orchestrated WWE show on the TV and it doesn't matter who you vote for. They're doing what they're doing and laughing at you while they're doing it. Mm. Whoever the candidate is that you vote for he simply says what he needs to and bribes who he needs to to get the votes to get in and then does what they were going to do anyway. Yeah. And so it's so corrupted now, it's time for that to be thrown over and we're here to do it and we're going to bring in Van Ashram Dharma. So at a certain point, we have to recognize that if we actually do what we're here to do, which is wrest control of the planet away from the Asuras and reorganize it under the principles of Bhagavad Dharma and Daivi Van Ashram Dharma, we are going to be identified as the critical threat to the existing system. We're going to go on a list. A hundred percent. We're going to go on the list that says, you know, 
The founder of this movement criticized Vivekananda even more strongly than Amogalila did. You know, did you know that the founder of the Hare Krishnas denied the moon landing, you know? Yeah. The, all those kind of lists. The, mm. It's going to be a very, for, for the, if you want the validation and the approval of the Asuras and the humans who have been bewildered by them, you're like simping at the bottom of the food chain, man. Yeah. But we ain't here for that. We're here to alpha dog this planet into submission to Lord Vishnu. Mm. We're here to put the, the, the jackbooted lotus foot of Lord Vishnu on the neck of humanity. <laughs> and they're not going to like it. They're going to love it. Yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate your um, conviction for sure. I don't have that conviction. And I, and I, maybe one day I'll have that, but I, um, I'm glad there are devotees like you who can just like, you know, give it straight and, and attract people to Krishna conscious doing it, doing that, doing it that way. Yeah. It takes all types, you know, it takes all types. That's a good way to end. I think. Yeah. Been... Yeah, it does. I don't, um. If you don't want to chant it in an anti-mandate protest, if you don't want to chant at a pride protest or pride parade, then I have no problem with that, you know? Yeah. You chant where you want to chant. Yeah. But I think that um, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, the holy names, should be added to absolutely every gathering on this planet and that we should not allow there to be large gatherings of, of humans, especially in, in volatile kind of... Um, circumstances without adding the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra to it as, yeah. as Kaitiaki, as guardians, as stewards on this planet, that is our job. And I don't think that there really is any meaning to being a Hare Krishna other than being someone who is that chanting Hare Krishna in all circumstances at all times is the way to be a Hare Krishna. That's what it is to be a Hare Krishna. Yeah. Ultimately, for me personally, yeah. Well, Sita Buddy, it's been it's been fun. Thanks for coming all the way from New Zealand to do this. Yeah, and how could I miss out on this? <laughs> well, that's the late morning program. Um, I'm I'm still doing donations uh, on my fundraiser. Please donate if you like what I do here, and um, like and subscribe. And what's that mantra? Like, subscribe, and like, comment, subscribe. Like, comment, subscribe. There you go. And uh, hopefully this is coming out pretty soon. Um, right now it's September. What is it? End 20, of September? 29th. Yeah. yeah. September 29th. I'm meant to start in the new year, but there's like a lot of cool guests like yourself coming on already. So might as well just put them out, you know? Yeah. And then iterate, get people to get excited about it. Sense of exactly. money. Yeah. Yeah. Super chat. Super chat. Yeah. yeah. Super chat. I should get into that. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Get Jamie doing the super chats <laughs> instead of just changing the cameras. Well, thanks again, Prabhu, for, for coming on. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare